Megan West with My Faith Votes. We're so glad you're joining us today. We have the distinct pleasure of having Dr. Jim Dennison with us. He is the Chief Vision Officer for Dennison Ministries. He's been a great friend to My Faith Votes. He writes an article called The Daily Article that actually we post on our website every day that just gives such great insight to cultural issues from a biblical worldview. So would you please welcome Dr. Jim Dennison. It's great to see you again. How are you? I'm great, Megan. So glad to be on with you again today. Thank you for your kindness and so grateful for your ministry, for all that you guys are doing, especially at a time like this. Mm. Well, and you have a new book out. It's called Respectfully, I Disagree. And it is the perfect book for this cultural moment because my goodness, we find ourselves in moments where there is so much incivility and you talk about civility. So just give a little brief overview of this book, why you wrote it, and just kind of as we talk about this in the moment that we're in, how we can be faithful Christians, it really in an uncivil society right now that's so divisive. Well, thank you. That really is the question, I think. And that's really what motivated the book. As I'm watching the news every day and social media and such, I've become concerned that Christians and our engagement with political issues and figures, ideas, that sort of thing, might be really jeopardizing our witness for the sake mm -hmm. of winning a, an argument. It's more important to win souls than arguments, as they say. And so I wrote the book to try to encourage Christians to be people of civility during the election so that our witness will be intact for after the election. We want to be the salt and light God's called us to be in these days, but we want to behave in such a way that allows us to do that when the election is done, past November the 3rd, and ongoing and whatever the culture is facing on the other side of all that. So that's really the point of it. We look at uh, really first the call to civility, kind of the, the scope and scale of the issue. Then we look second at the person of civility, the kind of person God can empower and equip and use. And then in the third section, we look at the practice of civility. And there we look at some real practical steps we can take to try to be salt and light in a very uncivil day. Well, and I think that's a good question too, because I, some Christians that I speak with really wrestle with, okay, I know that I need to be civil and I know that I need to also stand my ground and stand up for the biblical issues that are important to society that we see such moral decay in. Is there a balance? Is there a line between civility and maybe even the spiritual warfare that we're facing every day? Yeah, that's a great question because really there's a there's a middle lane here and then there's a kind of a if you think of it as a bowling alley, well, then there's gutter on either side, isn't there? On the mm -hmm. one side, we become so divisive that we lose our witness. On the other, we retreat from the culture so much that we have no witness. We keep the salt in the salt shaker. We keep light under the basket, the very thing Jesus told us not to do. So to me, the key to staying in the middle is Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. That is the mantra I really believe that believers should be grasping and celebrating in these days. It's speaking the truth. It's First Peter 3. It's making a defense for the faith that we have. It's standing up for the truth. You think of Nathan standing up to David. You think of Jesus with the Pharisees in Matthew 23. You think of Peter with the Sanhedrin in Acts 4 and 5. So clearly we're to stand for biblical truth, but we're to do so with biblical grace. We're to speak the truth in love. We're to demonstrate the grace of Jesus even as we defend the word of Jesus. And it's that balance that the Lord calls us to today. That's a good point. And something I love about your perspective is you you approach things from a biblical perspective, but also you have such a great grasp of history. Mm -hmm. And looking at the context just throughout Christianity and biblical history, are we like Rome? And you kind of talk about this in your book. What What's the, the correlation or are we missing the mark? Are we like Rome and back in Bible times? Give us a little perspective on that. Yeah, thank you. It's, a, I think, a very important historical place to kind of begin the conversation. I think we are very much like the Roman Empire in two ways. In a variety of ways, we're not. There's no way we would contrast our, our economic systems to theirs, our uh, democratic systems to theirs, clearly, but on two levels that I think really inform this conversation. On the one side, Roman spirituality was highly transactional. You had these gods of Mount Olympus that they inherited essentially from the Greeks. And you had this transactional relationship with these gods where you sacrifice to the god of war so that when you're going off to war, he might keep you safe. Or you sacrifice to Poseidon or Neptune if you're about to make a voyage or sacrifice to Athena if you're looking for wisdom. So you give what the gods want and they give what you want. This kind of transactional religion that we've inherited. Go to church on Sunday so God will bless you on Monday. Have a quiet time at the start of the day so that God will bless your day. It's a transactional religion when what the Lord wants is a transformational relationship. And it's that relationship that empowers us to be people of civility. 
Otherwise, we're trying to be religious on our own, and we really can't do that. I can't be any more civil than anybody else. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. And so I have to get out of this transactional religion and, and choose the transform, transformational relationship that the Lord offers us, that he shares with us. Well, the second way in which I think the Roman Empire informs our time today, they clearly were pre-institutional Christianity. In the first century, really up until Constantine in the fourth century, Christianity was largely an illegal movement. We weren't allowed to own buildings. We weren't uh, identified with specific institutions. If you ask an apostolic Christian, where is the church? They wouldn't know how to answer your question any more than if you ask, where is the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? It was a movement, not an institution. Eventually under Constantine, it starts building buildings. It becomes monastic and institutionalized and all of that. Well, now we're in a day when Christian institutions are considered largely to be irrelevant to the secular mm -hmm. world, where they don't see clergy as relevant and church programs and an institution as relevant. So in so many ways, we're back to where we were. I often say the 21st century is more like the first century than any in between. And that's really good news because according mm -hmm. to Acts 17, they turned the world upside down. If we'll go back to that first piece, if we'll seek a transformational relationship with Jesus, and not think of church so much as a building and, and a program as a relationship, an ongoing living relationship, then the Holy Spirit will empower us to be the people of civility we need to reach people who aren't coming to our institutions, who aren't coming into our buildings or joining our memberships, but they're desperate for the light that we can show into a dark and dying world. Hmm. And that's such a great point because I think there are Christians, and even myself, I think, how can I change culture today just from my little point of view? Is that even possible when it seems like it's getting so much more challenging mm -hmm. to be a Christian in America? But you talk a lot about that. Speak to that a little bit about just that mustard seed as well. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. And that really is one of the places the enemy wants to deceive us, is to cause us to think that the culture is so far gone that the world is so secularized, it's so immoral, it's so rejecting of biblical morality that there's really nothing that can be done here. Well, that's just not true. You look all, as you say, all across biblical metaphors for the church, and they commonly have this idea of a tiny mustard seed that makes a tree so large that the birds settle in its branches. We're the salt of the earth, and it doesn't take much salt to make a huge difference in the food that it's seasoning. We're the light of the world. It doesn't take much light to be very visible in a dark room. In fact, the darker the room, the more visible the light. Quick example of that. Some years ago, I was in Carlsbad Caverns as part of a tour group down there. So they take you down into the caverns and you're at this one place and you're seated. And then the tour guide turns off his flashlight. Darkest thing I've ever seen. Couldn't see the hand in front of your face. You could feel the darkness. It was that dark. And then after a bit of time, the tour guide turned his flashlight back on. And no matter where you happen to be facing in this cavern, in this pitch black darkness, when the light came on, you couldn't help instinctively turning to the light. Couldn't help it. You were drawn to the light. Well, that's how light works in dark. We are the light of the world, and therefore it doesn't take much light to make an overpowering difference in the darkness. That's why John 1 says that the dark has never overcome yeah. the light. So the good news is, if we will be salt, if we will be light, if we will be that mustard seed, if we'll be who Jesus made us to be, out of this transformational relationship we have with him, he will use our influence in ways we cannot imagine. Alfred North Whitehead said, great people plant trees they'll never sit under. Really like a metaphor by Oswald Chambers, who says, the river touches shores that the source never sees. Mm -hmm. So know that. Know that God is using your influence in ways you can't measure, in ways you can't even imagine. If you'll simply be faithful in a transformational relationship, he's using you to change the culture in ways that matter forever. Well, and that's true. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And you talk a lot about that and just living out the fruits of the spirit to a culture that really doesn't quite understand what that even looks like. Or, you know, I see in the news today, people really don't understand what Christianity is. And maybe that's our fault for not living out the fruits of the spirit. So what, what kind of advice do you have for us mm -hmm. in the culture around us to be that light by having the Holy Spirit shine through us? 
Yeah, thank you. That is the most practical question we could be discussing today. It's that middle part of the book. It's the mainly the, the reason why I wanted to write that book at a time like this to empower us relative to our witness in these divisive days of this election. And that is that I cannot be a person of civility by myself. No matter how hard I try, no matter how much earlier I get up or how much later I stay up, we have this American kind of ethos that has this idea that we can do anything if we just try harder. Well, I can't convict anybody of their sin. I can't save a soul. I can't change a life. I cannot manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the descriptions of civility, and I can't do that myself. The good news is I don't have to. That's why these are the fruit of the Spirit. So if I could make every Christian do one thing, it would be this. Ephesians 5.18 commands us to be filled with the Spirit. The Greek means to be being controlled by, be submitted to the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing present tense command. It's a present, it's a present imperative in the scripture. If I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, he makes me the child of God and I'll always be the child of God. I don't have to keep redoing that. I'll always be his child. But I have to every day decide whether I'm going to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. So I would want every believer to start the day by obeying Ephesians 5. Start every single day by getting alone with God, even for just a few moments. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you anything in your life that's, that is displeasing God. Confess what comes to your thoughts. Ask him to take control of your mind and your life and lead you through the day. Pray through your day and submit it to him. And then walk through the day in the power of the Spirit. If you face a challenge, you pray about it an opportunity you pray about it. If you fall into sin, you ask him to forgive you and restore you. Stay plugged in. Stay connected. Practice the presence of Jesus, as Brother Lawrence said. Walk through the day in the power of the Spirit. And if you'll do that, you'll manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You'll be in this transformational relationship, and you'll be the person of civility God can use as salt and light in the world today. Mm, That's such a critical reminder. And we need to be preaching that to ourselves every day because Mm -hmm. I think we get so easy at, oh, look at what's wrong with everyone else around me, but it has to start with me. And it starts with my relationship with Christ and where I begin. And am I, my own challenge to myself is, am I beginning the day in the word or am I beginning the day on social media? And my day is going to go differently according to where I start. And that's just a powerful reminder that, Mm. man, we've got to keep the main thing, the main thing. I know we talk about that a lot here at My Faith Votes. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to switch gears. Just a little bit, because obviously we're just weeks away from the election. And at My Faith Votes, we know that 25 million Christians will typically stay home in presidential election cycles. We don't we see that there's this great need of Christians stepping into the voting booth to bring their faith Mm -hmm. to the issues and to select candidates that will line up as best as possible with just the things that we stand for as Christians. And I'd I'd love your advice to those Christians who say, I'm done, I'm out of it. I just don't want to step into the political world because it's too political. I get it. In fact, I wrote a white paper that came up on our website this week. What does the Bible say about politics? And in that, we first of all discuss what you just said, Megan, the, the temptation to believe that politics are so dirty or so frustrating, uh, that the uh, discourse is so corrosive that I'm just going to pull back from that. I'm just going to withdraw from that. Well, the fact is, the darker the room, the more necessary the light. And mm-hmm. if we are the light of the world and the room is dark, then it's kind of our fault that we're not bringing that light where it needs to be. So the more divisive our politics, the more necessary our witness, the more necessary our engagement. So how do we do that? Well, it's on kind of an ascending scale. First of all, biblically, we're obviously called to pray for our leaders. First Timothy 2 makes that clear, that we're to pray for those in authority, whether we agree with them or not, whether we voted for them or not, whether we support their positions or not, we are called to pray for them. In fact, the more we disagree, the more we need to pray. Second, we are called by scripture to be good citizens, and that means to vote. It's absolutely vital and critical. I believe that it is a, it's a mandate of Scripture to be engaged in culture on that level, to be a steward of the opportunities you have. If any Christian listening to this conversation right now is deciding whether or not to participate by voting, I wish they could go with me to Cuba. I've been down to Cuba 10 times, and I would tell you every Cuban I know would trade places with us in a moment to have an opportunity to have a voice in deciding who their leaders would be and what direction their culture would take. It's an absolutely critical stewardship that we have to vote. On a third level, we can engage in the political process. If we don't like where it's going, we need to be part of that. You can contact people that are in your local precincts, people that are engaged in your local political process and be a part of that. On a fourth level, I think God's calling more Christians into public service than are answering the call. 
I'm convinced of that, in fact. And so I believe every person listening to this should be praying, Lord, do you want me to run for office? Do you want me to be involved on some way, on some level in political service? And then fifth, you can engage with those who are in political service. I know that you know this and people in your terrific ministry, but I'm often surprised at the degree to which people don't understand how much one letter can change a legislator's mind, how much one phone call, one email, one word of communication. They used to, I don't know if it's still true, but there used to be this kind of shorthand in the restaurant business that for every person that complained about the food, there were 20 that didn't. So if they get a complaint about the food, they multiply that by 20. What they're afraid of is the person that didn't like the food and just left. So they always respond disproportionately to the complaints they get. Well, that's the same way it works. I've been assured of this by elected leaders over the years. They want your engagement. They want to hear from you. And the less you feel like they should hear you, the more they need to hear you, right? And so we need to be engaging in that sense as well. So if we'll pray for our leaders, if we'll vote, if we'll be involved in the process, even consider running, and certainly reach out to and be involved with those in elected position, now we're utilizing the privilege of being citizens of the greatest nation in the world. Mm, absolutely. And something that was memorable to me in our last conversation with you was you spoke to the issue of people selecting candidates based on personality rather than positions or policy. Speak to how we can keep that in perspective as we enter the voting booth, especially in such an emotionally charged culture, mm -hmm. to really think more with our heads and not always just with our hearts. Such a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. There are three ways we know everything. It's the rational, the practical, and the intuitive. Doing a little philosophy with you here for a second. So we do math rationally. We start a car practically. We like people intuitively. Well, one of those tends to dominate our personality. We tend to be primarily rational by nature, or practical by nature, or intuitive by nature. But when we're in a relational context, almost always we're driven by the intuitive. Well, voting is an intensely relational activity. You're voting for a person. Sometimes you're voting, I understand, for a, for a position or for uh, something that's in front of you relative to something that uh, the culture is considering or that might be a position, uh, a bond election, something like that. But most of the time we're thinking about a person. And as we're considering whether or not to vote for or against that person, it gets very intuitive very quickly. Well, when we talked before, I might have mentioned that a study done that fascinated me was since 1960, in likability indexes, and they had specific ways of measuring this, the more likable candidate won every presidential election from 1960 forward, except the year 2000 when Bush and Gore tied, and we know how that election turned out. Yeah. So unfortunately or fortunately, so much of the time we're voting based on likability, based on personality, based on what we think of the individual, when what matters is the positions they're taking and how that's going to be driven forward into the culture. It matters far more that they're articulating biblical positions, biblical morality in places that the Lord can bless than it is that I happen to like or not like that key individual, whoever that might be. So I think that's a real important principle for Christians is to vote by the Bible, not by the intuitive. Vote by what scripture says rather than by what my mind happened or my heart might happen to be, be drawn toward because it's the intuitive that can lead us so quickly astray. Quick example of that. I get to go to Israel a lot. I've been more than 30 times over the years. We always take people to Yad Vashem, uh, the Holocaust Museum there. And while we're there, we go through a part of the display that explains anti-Semitism. And part of what it explains is really hard for us to understand today, looking back at it. But back in the 30s, Adolf Hitler was seen as a great world leader, tragically. He was so charismatic he was seen as so intuitively connected to his people, to this Aryan race, to rebuilding his people's future. And so much of what the Germans did was to follow the intuitive rather than analyzing the policies, the direction, rather than voting by scripture. And we saw what happened as a result. Well, I'm certainly not saying we're at that place now, but I am saying we need to vote by biblical truth because that's what makes the ultimate decision. Absolutely. And we've got a number of resources on our website at myfaithvotes.org that help people to look at all the candidates, see their endorsements, see their positions, where they stand, so you can make an informed vote when you're at the voting booth. So, gosh, Dr. Jen Dennison, we just so appreciate your wisdom. Any final thoughts and encouragement for our followers as they prepare to vote? Well, first of all, I want to endorse what you're doing. There are others, as you know, other organizations that are doing what you're doing, but it's really in a partisan way. What they're really trying to do is to get you to vote for one particular candidate or support one particular party. And I know that My Faith Votes does not do that. 
That's why I so endorse you. That's why I'm happy to be in this conversation with you now, because we're a nonpartisan ministry as well. And I just so admire that. So appreciate the integrity with which you do what you do. And I'm just so thrilled to endorse you and your ministry to this larger audience today. And then on a second level, I would just be encouraging as you are, our people to be praying during this electoral season, not only for the candidates, not only for the outcome of the election, but for us to be the people God wants us to be today and tomorrow. Winning an election is critical. Winning souls is forever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we have just so appreciate your wisdom and your insight. We love that you're a friend of My Faith Votes. We, you can see um, Dr. Dennison's daily article every day on our website where he just breaks down current events from a biblical perspective. And that's so helpful. And for those of you wanting to find that book, you can actually go to the Denison Forum website. We'll put that all information um, here that you can see. And you can get that book. It's called Respectfully, I Disagree. It's very helpful and just such great perspective and wisdom as we are Christians in a crazy culture right now, but proudly and boldly standing for Christ. So Dr. Denison, thank you so much for joining us. What a privilege to be with you today, Megan. God bless you. All right. Thanks. Same to you.